And now, night. They called him Moshe the Beetle, as if his entire life he had never had a surname. He was the jack of all trades in a Hasidic house of prayer, a shtibl. The Jews of Sigurd, the little town in Transylvania where I spent my childhood, were fond of him. He was poor and lived in utter penury. As a rule, our townspeople, while they did help the needy, did not particularly like them. Moshe the Beetle was the exception. He stayed out of people's way. His presence bothered no one. He had mastered the art of rendering himself insignificant, invisible. Physically, he was as awkward as a clown. His waif-like shyness made people smile. As for me, I liked his wide, dreamy eyes gazing off into the distance. He spoke little. He sang, or rather, he chanted, and the few snatches I caught here and there spoke of divine suffering, of the Shekhinah in exile, where, according to Kabbalah, it awaits its redemption linked to that of man. I met him in 1941. I was almost 13 and deeply observant. By day I studied Talmud, and by night I would run to the synagogue to weep over the destruction of the temple. One day I asked my father to find me a master who could guide me in my studies of Kabbalah. You are too young for that. Maimonides tells us that one must be 30 before venturing into the world of mysticism, a world fraught with peril. First you must study the basic subjects, those you are able to comprehend. My father was a cultured man, rather unsentimental. He rarely displayed his feelings, not even within his family, and was more involved with the welfare of others than with that of his own kin. The Jewish community of Siget held him in highest esteem. His advice on public and even private matters was frequently sought. There were four of us children, Hilda the eldest, then B, I was the third, and the only son, Tzipora, was the youngest. My parents ran a store, Hilda and B helped with the work. As for me, my place was in the house of study, or so they said. There are no Kabbalists in Siget, my father would often tell me. He wanted to drive the idea of studying Kabbalah from my mind, in vain. I succeeded on my own in finding a master for myself in the person of Moshe the Beetle. He had watched me one day as I prayed at dusk. Why do you cry when you pray? he asked, as though he knew me well. I don't know, I answered, troubled. I had never asked myself that question. I cried because, because something inside me felt the need to cry. That was all I knew. Why do you pray? he asked after a moment. Why did I pray? Strange question. Why did I live? Why did I breathe? I don't know, I told him, even more troubled and ill at ease. I don't know. From that day on, I saw him often. He explained to me with great emphasis that every question possessed a power that was lost in the answer. Man comes closer to God through the questions he asks him, he liked to say. Therein lies true dialogue. Man asks and God replies. But we don't understand his replies. We cannot understand them. Because they dwell in the depths of our souls and remain there until we die. The real answers, Eliezer, you will find only within yourself. And why do you pray, Moshe? I asked him. I pray to the God within me for the strength to ask him the real questions. We spoke that way almost every evening, remaining in the synagogue long after all the faithful had gone sitting in the semi-darkness where only a few half-burnt candles provided a flickering light. One evening, I told him how unhappy I was not to be able to find in Sigurd a master to teach me the Zohar, the Kabbalistic works, the secrets of Jewish mysticism. 
He smiled indulgently. After a long silence, he said, There are a thousand and one gates, allowing entry into the orchard of mystical truth. Every human being has his own gate. He must not err and wish to enter the orchard through a gate other than his own. That would present a danger not only for the one entering, but also for those who are already inside. And Moshe the Beetle, the poorest of the poor of Siget, spoke to me for hours on end about the Kabbalah's revelations and its mysteries. Thus began my initiation. Together we would read over and over again the same page of the Zohar, not to learn it by heart, but to discover within the very essence of divinity. And in the course of those evenings, I became convinced that Moshe the Beetle would help me enter eternity, into that time when question and answer would become one. And then, one day, all foreign Jews were expelled from Siget, and Moshe the Beetle was a foreigner. Crammed into cattle cars by the Hungarian police, they cried silently. Standing on the station platform, we too were crying. The train disappeared over the horizon. All that was left was thick, dirty smoke. Behind me, someone said, sighing, What do you expect? That's war. The deportees were quickly forgotten. A few days after they left, it was rumored that they were in Galicia, working, and even that they were content with their fate. Days went by, then weeks and months. Life was normal again. A calm, reassuring wind blew through our homes. The shopkeepers were doing good business, the students lived among their books, and the children played in the streets. One day, as I was about to enter the synagogue, I saw Moshe the Beetle sitting on a bench near the entrance. He told me what had happened to him and his companions. The train with the deportees had crossed the Hungarian border and, once in Polish territory, had been taken over by the Gestapo. The train had stopped. The Jews were ordered to get off and onto waiting trucks. The trucks headed toward the forest. There, everybody was ordered to get out. They were forced to dig huge trenches. When they had finished their work, the men from the Gestapo began theirs. Without passion or haste, they shot their prisoners who were forced to approach the trench one by one and offer their necks. Infants were tossed into the air and used as targets for the machine guns. This took place in the Galician forest near Colomea. How had he, Moshe the Beetle, been able to escape? By a miracle. He was wounded in the leg and left for dead. Day after day, Night after night, he went from one Jewish house to the next, telling his story and that of Malka, the young girl who lay dying for three days, and that of Toby, the tailor, who begged to die before his sons were killed. Moshe was not the same. The joy in his eyes was gone. He no longer sang. He no longer mentioned either God or Kabbalah. He spoke only of what he had seen. But people not only refused to believe his tales, they refused to listen. Some even insinuated that he only wanted their pity, that he was imagining things. Others flatly said that he had gone mad. As for Moshe, he wept and pleaded, Jews, listen to me, that's all I ask of you. No money, no pity, just listen to me. He kept shouting in synagogue between the prayer at dusk and the evening prayer. Even I did not believe him. I often sat with him after services and listened to his tales, trying to understand his grief. But all I felt was pity. They think I'm mad, he whispered, and tears like drops of wax flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him the question, why do you want people to believe you so much? In your place, I would not care whether they believed me or not. 
He closed his eyes as if to escape time. You don't understand, he said in despair. You cannot understand. I was saved miraculously. I succeeded in coming back. Where did I get my strength? I wanted to return to Sigurd to describe to you my death so that you might ready yourselves while there is still time. Life? I no longer care to live. I am alone. But I wanted to come back to warn you. Only no one is listening to me. This was toward the end of 1942. Thereafter, life seemed normal once again. London Radio, which we listened to every evening, announced encouraging news. The daily bombings of Germany and Stalingrad, the preparation of the Second Front. And so, we, the Jews of Sigurd, waited for better days that surely were soon to come. I continued to devote myself to my studies, Talmud during the day and Kabbalah at night. My father took care of his business and the community. My grandfather came to spend Rosh Hashanah with us so as to attend the services of the celebrated Rebbe of Borsha. My mother was beginning to think it was high time to find an appropriate match for Hilda. Thus passed the year 1943. Spring 1944. Splendid news from the Russian front. There could no longer be any doubt Germany would be defeated. It was only a matter of time, months or weeks, perhaps. The trees were in bloom. It was a year like so many others, with its spring, its engagements, its weddings and its births. The people were saying, the Red Army is advancing with giant strides. Hitler will not be able to harm us, even if he wants to. Yes. We even doubted his resolve to exterminate us. Annihilate an entire people? Wipe out a population dispersed throughout so many nations, so many millions of people? By what means? In the middle of the 20th century? And thus my elders concerned themselves with all manner of things, strategy, diplomacy, politics, and Zionism but not with their own fate. Even Moshe the Beetle had fallen silent. He was weary of talking. He would drift through synagogue or through the streets, hunched over, eyes cast down, avoiding people's gaze. In those days, it was still possible to buy emigration certificates to Palestine. I had asked my father to sell everything, to liquidate everything, and to leave. I'm too old, my son, he answered. Too old to start a new life. Too old to start from scratch in some distant land. Budapest Radio announced that the fascist party had seized power. The regent, Miklos Horty, was forced to ask a leader of the pro-Nazi Nielosh party to form a new government. Yet we still were not worried. Of course, we had heard of the fascists, but it was all in the abstract. It meant nothing more to us than a change of ministry. The next day brought really disquieting news. German troops had penetrated Hungarian territory with the government's approval. Finally, people began to worry in earnest. One of my friends, Moshe Chaim Berkovitz, returned from the capital for Passover and told us the Jews of Budapest live in an atmosphere of fear and terror. Anti-Semitic acts take place every day, in the streets, on the trains. The fascists attack Jewish stores, synagogues. The situation is becoming very serious. The news spread through Siget like wildfire. Soon, that was all people talked about. But not for long. Optimism soon revived. The Germans will not come this far. They will stay in Budapest. For strategic reasons, for political reasons. In less than three days, German army vehicles made their appearance on our streets. Anguish. German soldiers, with their steel helmets and their death's head emblem. Still, our first impressions of the Germans were rather reassuring. 
The officers were billeted in private homes, even in Jewish homes. Their attitude toward their hosts was distant but polite. They never demanded the impossible, made no offensive remarks, and sometimes even smiled at the lady of the house. A German officer lodged in the Khan's house across the street from us. We were told he was a charming man, calm, likable, and polite. Three days after he moved in, he brought Mrs. Khan a box of chocolates. The optimists were jubilant. Well, what did we tell you? You wouldn't believe us. There they are, your Germans. What do you say now? Where is their famous cruelty? The Germans were already in our town. The fascists were already in power. The verdict was already out. And the Jews of Siget were still smiling. The eight days of Passover. The weather was sublime. My mother was busy in the kitchen. The synagogues were no longer open. People gathered in private homes. No need to provoke the Germans. Almost every rabbi's home became a house of prayer. We drank, we ate, we sang. The Bible commands us to rejoice during the eight days of celebration. But our hearts were not in it. We wished the holiday would end so as not to have to pretend. On the seventh day of Passover, the curtain finally rose. The Germans arrested the leaders of the Jewish community. From that moment on, everything happened very quickly. The race toward death had begun. First edict, Jews were prohibited from leaving their residences for three days under penalty of death. Moshe the beetle came running to our house. I warned you, he shouted, and left without waiting for a response. The same day, the Hungarian police burst into every Jewish home in town. A Jew was henceforth forbidden to own gold, jewelry, or any valuables. Everything had to be handed over to the authorities under penalty of death. My father went down to the cellar and buried our savings. As for my mother, she went on tending to the many chores in the house. Sometimes she would stop and gaze at us in silence. Three days later, a new decree. Every Jew had to wear the yellow star. Some prominent members of the community came to consult with my father, who had connections at the upper levels of the Hungarian police. They wanted to know what he thought of the situation. My father's view was that it was not all bleak. Or perhaps he just did not want to discourage the others to throw salt on their wounds. The yellow star? So what? It's not lethal. Poor father. Of what then did you die? But new edicts were already being issued. We no longer had the right to frequent restaurants or cafes, to travel by rail, to attend synagogue, to be on the streets after six o'clock in the evening. Then came the ghettos. Two ghettos were created in Siget. A large one in the center of town occupied four streets, and another smaller one extended over several alleyways on the outskirts of town. The street we lived on, Serpent Street, was in the first ghetto. We therefore could remain in our house, but as it occupied a corner, the windows facing the street outside the ghetto had to be sealed. We gave some of our rooms to relatives who had been driven out of their homes. Little by little, life returned to normal. The barbed wire that encircled us like a wall did not fill us with real fear. In fact, we felt this was not a bad thing. We were entirely among ourselves, a small Jewish republic. A Jewish council was appointed as well as a Jewish police force, a welfare agency, a labor committee, a health agency a whole governmental apparatus. People thought this was a good thing. We would no longer have to look at all those hostile faces, endure those hate-filled stares. No more fear, no more anguish. We would live among Jews, among brothers. Of course, there still were unpleasant moments. Every day, the Germans came looking for men to load coal into the military trains. Volunteers for this kind of work were few, but apart from that, the atmosphere was oddly peaceful and reassuring. 
Most people thought that we would remain in the ghetto until the end of the war, until the arrival of the Red Army. Afterward, everything would be as before. The ghetto was ruled by neither German nor Jew. It was ruled by delusion. Some two weeks before Shavuot, a sunny spring day, people strolled seemingly carefree through the crowded streets. They exchanged cheerful greetings, children played games, rolling hazelnuts on the sidewalks. Some schoolmates and I were in Ezra Malik's garden studying a Talmudic treatise. Night fell. Some twenty people had gathered in our courtyard. My father was sharing some anecdotes and holding forth on his opinion of the situation. He was a good storyteller. Suddenly, the gate opened, and Stern, a former shopkeeper who now was a policeman, entered and took my father aside. Despite the growing darkness, I could see my father turn pale. What's wrong? we asked. I don't know. I have been summoned to a special meeting of the council. Something must have happened. The story he had interrupted would remain unfinished. I'm going right now, he said. I'll return as soon as possible. I'll tell you everything. Wait for me. We were ready to wait as long as necessary. The courtyard turned into something like an antechamber to an operating room. We stood, waiting for the door to open. Neighbors, hearing the rumors, had joined us. We stared at our watches. Time had slowed down. What was the meaning of such a long session? I have a bad feeling, said my mother. This afternoon, I saw new faces in the ghetto. Two German officers. I believe they were Gestapo. Since we've been here, we have not seen a single officer. It was close to midnight. Nobody felt like going to sleep, though some people briefly went to check on their homes. Others left, but asked to be called as soon as my father returned. At last, the door opened and he appeared. His face was drained of color. He was quickly surrounded. Tell us, tell us what's happening. Say something. At that moment, we were so anxious to hear something encouraging, a few words telling us that there was nothing to worry about, that the meeting had been routine, just a review of welfare and health problems. But one glance at my father's face left no doubt. The news is terrible, he said at last. And then one word, transports. The ghetto was to be liquidated entirely. Departures were to take place street by street starting the next day. We wanted to know everything, every detail. We were stunned, yet we wanted to fully absorb the bitter news. Where would they take us? That was a secret. A secret for all, except one, the president of the Jewish council. But he would not tell, or could not tell. The Gestapo had threatened to shoot him if he talked. There are rumors, my father said, his voice breaking, that we are being taken somewhere in Hungary to work in the brick factories. It seems that here we are too close to the front. After a moment's silence, he added, Each of us will be allowed to bring his personal belongings. A backpack, some food, a few items of clothing, nothing else. Again, heavy silence. Go and wake the neighbors, said my father. They must get ready. The shadows around me roused themselves as if from a deep sleep and left silently in every direction. For a moment, we remained alone. Suddenly, Batya Reich, a relative who lived with us, entered the room. Someone is knocking at the sealed window, the one that faces outside. It was only after the war that I found out who had knocked that night. It was an inspector of the Hungarian police, a friend of my father's. Before we entered the ghetto, he had told us, don't worry, I'll warn you if there is danger. Had he been able to speak to us that night, we might still have been able to flee. But by the time we succeeded in opening the window, it was too late. There was nobody outside. The ghetto was awake. One after the other, the lights were going on behind the windows. 
I went into the house of one of my father's friends. I woke the head of the household, a man with a gray beard and the gaze of a dreamer. His back was hunched over from untold nights spent studying. Get up, sir, get up! You must ready yourself for the journey. Tomorrow you will be expelled, you and your family, you and all the other Jews. Where to? Please don't ask me, sir. Don't ask questions. God alone could answer you. For heaven's sake, get up! He had no idea what I was talking about. He probably thought I had lost my mind. What are you saying? Get ready for the journey? What journey? Why? What is happening? Have you gone mad? Half asleep, he was staring at me. His eyes filled with terror, as though he expected me to burst out laughing and tell him to go back to bed, to sleep, to dream, that nothing had happened. It was all in jest. My throat was dry and the words were choking me. Paralyzing my lips, there was nothing else to say. At last he understood. He got out of bed and began to dress automatically. Then he went over to the bed where his wife lay sleeping and with infinite tenderness touched her forehead. She opened her eyes and it seemed to me that a smile crossed her lips. Then he went to wake his two children. They woke with a start, torn from their dreams. I fled. Time went by quickly. It was already four o'clock in the morning. My father was running right and left, exhausted, consoling friends, checking with the Jewish council just in case the order had been rescinded. To the last moment, people clung to hope. The women were boiling eggs, roasting meat, preparing cakes, sewing backpacks. The children were wandering about aimlessly, not knowing what to do with themselves to stay out of the way of the grown-ups. Our backyard looked like a marketplace. Valuable objects, precious rugs, silver candlesticks, Bibles and other ritual objects were strewn over the dusty grounds, pitiful relics that seemed never to have had a home. All this under a magnificent blue sky. By eight o'clock in the morning, Weariness had settled into our veins, our limbs, our brains like molten lead. I was in the midst of prayer when suddenly there was shouting in the streets. I quickly unwound my phylacteries and ran to the window. Hungarian police had entered the ghetto and were yelling in the street nearby, All Jews outside, hurry! They were followed by Jewish police who, their voices breaking, told us, The time has come. You must leave all this. The Hungarian police used their rifle butts, their clubs, to indiscriminately strike old men and women, children and cripples. One by one, the houses emptied and the streets filled with people carrying bundles. By ten o'clock, everyone was outside. The police were taking roll calls, once, twice, twenty times. The heat was oppressive. Sweat streamed from people's faces and bodies. Children were crying for water. Water. There was water close by inside the houses, the backyards. But it was forbidden to break rank. Water, mother, I'm thirsty. Some of the Jewish police surreptitiously went to fill a few jugs. My sisters and I were still allowed to move about as we were destined for the last convoy and so we helped as best we could. At last, at one o'clock in the afternoon, came the signal to leave. There was joy. Yes, joy. People must have thought there could be no greater torment in God's hell than that of being stranded here on the sidewalk among the bundles in the middle of the street under a blazing sun. Anything seemed preferable to that. They began to walk without another glance at the abandoned streets, the dead empty houses, the gardens, the tombstones. On everyone's back there was a sack, in everyone's eyes, tears and distress. Slowly, heavily, the procession advanced toward the gate of the ghetto. And there I was, on the sidewalk, watching them file past, unable to move. Here came the chief rabbi, hunched over, his face strange-looking without a beard, a bundle on his back. His very presence in the procession was enough to make the scene seem surreal. It was like a page torn from a book, a historical novel perhaps, dealing with the captivity in Babylon or the Spanish Inquisition. They passed me by, one after the other, my teachers, my friends, 
the others, some of whom I had once feared, some of whom I had found ridiculous, all those whose lives I had shared for years. There they went, defeated, their bundles, their lives in tow, having left behind their homes, their childhood. They passed me by like beaten dogs, with never a glance in my direction. They must have envied me. The procession disappeared around the corner. A few steps more and they were beyond the ghetto walls. The street resembled fairgrounds deserted in haste. There was a little of everything. Suitcases, briefcases, bags, knives, dishes, banknotes, papers, faded portraits. All the things one planned to take along and finally left behind. They had ceased to matter. Open rooms everywhere. Gaping doors and windows looked out into the void. It all belonged to everyone since it no longer belonged to anyone. It was there for the taking, an open tomb. The summer sun. We had spent the day without food, but we were not really hungry, we were exhausted. My father had accompanied the deportees as far as the ghetto's gate. They first had been herded through the main synagogue, where they were thoroughly searched to make sure they were not carrying away gold, silver, or any other valuables. There had been incidents of hysteria and harsh blows. When will the hour turn? I asked my father. The day after tomorrow. Unless things work out. A miracle, perhaps. Where were the people being taken? Did anyone know yet? No. The secret was well kept. Night had fallen. That evening we went to bed early. My father said, Sleep peacefully, children. Nothing will happen until the day after tomorrow, Tuesday. Monday went by like a small summer cloud, like a dream in the first hours of dawn. Intent on preparing our backpacks, on baking breads and cakes, we no longer thought about anything. The verdict had been delivered. That evening, our mother made us go to bed early. To conserve our strength, she said. It was to be the last night spent in our house. I was up at dawn. I wanted to have time to pray before leaving. My father had risen before all of us to seek information in town. He returned around eight o'clock. Good news. We were not leaving town today. We were only moving to the small ghetto. That is where we were to wait for the last transport. We would be the last to leave. At nine o'clock, the previous Sunday's scenes were repeated. Policemen wielding clubs were shouting, All Jews outside! We were ready. I went out first. I did not want to look at my parents' faces. I did not want to break into tears. We remained sitting in the middle of the street, like the others two days earlier. The same hellish sun, the same thirst. Only there was no one left to bring us water. I looked at my house in which I had spent years seeking my God, fasting to hasten the coming of the Messiah, imagining what my life would be like later. Yet I felt little sadness. My mind was empty. Get up, roll call. We stood, we were counted, we sat down, we got up again, over and over. We waited impatiently to be taken away. What were they waiting for? Finally, the order came. Forward! March! My father was crying. It was the first time I saw him cry. I had never thought it possible. As for my mother, she was walking, her face a mask, without a word, deep in thought. I looked at my little sister, Tsipora, her blonde hair neatly combed, her red coat over her arm, a little girl of seven. On her back, a bag too heavy for her. She was clenching her teeth. She already knew it was useless to complain. Here and there, the police were lashing out with their clubs. Faster! I had no strength left. The journey had just begun, and I already felt so weak. Faster! 
Faster, move, you lazy good-for-nothings! The Hungarian police were screaming. That was when I began to hate them. And my hatred remains our only link today. They were our first oppressors. They were the first faces of hell and death. They ordered us to run. We began to run. Who would have thought that we were so strong? From behind their windows, from behind their shutters, our fellow citizens watched as we passed. We finally arrived at our destination. Throwing down our bundles, we dropped to the ground. Oh, God, Master of the Universe, in your infinite compassion, have mercy on us. The small ghetto. Only three days ago, people were living here. People who owned the things we were using now. They had been expelled, and we had already forgotten all about them. The chaos was even greater here than in the large ghetto. Its inhabitants evidently had been caught by surprise. I visited the rooms that had been occupied by my Uncle Mendel's family. On the table, a half-finished bowl of soup. A platter of dough waiting to be baked. Everywhere on the floor there were books. Had my uncle meant to take them along? We settled in. What a word. I went looking for wood. My sisters lit a fire. Despite her fatigue, my mother began to prepare a meal. We cannot give up. We cannot give up, she kept repeating. People's morale was not so bad. We were beginning to get used to the situation. There were those who even voiced optimism. The Germans were running out of time to expel us, they argued. Sadly, for those who had already been deported, it would be too late. As for us, chances were that we would be allowed to go on with our miserable little lives until the end of the war. The ghetto was not guarded. One could enter and leave as one pleased. Maria, our former maid, came to see us. Sobbing, she begged us to come with her to her village where she had prepared a safe shelter. My father wouldn't hear of it. He told me and my big sisters, If you wish, go there. I shall stay here with your mother and the little one. Naturally, we refused to be separated. Night. No one was praying for the night to pass quickly. The stars were but sparks of the immense conflagration that was consuming us. Were this conflagration to be extinguished one day, nothing would be left in the sky but extinct stars and unseeing eyes. There was nothing else to do but to go to bed. In the beds of those who had moved on, we needed to rest, to gather our strength. At daybreak, the gloom had lifted. The mood was more confident. There were those who said, Who knows? They may be sending us away for our own good. The front is getting closer. We shall soon hear the guns. And then, surely the civilian population will be evacuated. They worry lest we join the partisans. As far as I'm concerned, this whole business of deportation is nothing but a big farce. Don't laugh. They just want to steal our valuables and jewelry. They know that it has all been buried and that they will have to dig to find it. So much easier to do when the owners are on vacation. On vacation. This kind of talk that nobody believed helped pass the time. The few days we spent here went by, pleasantly enough, in relative calm, people rather got along. There no longer was any distinction between rich and poor, notables and the others. We were all people condemned to the same fate, still unknown. Saturday, the day of rest, was the day chosen for our expulsion. The night before we had sat down to the traditional Friday night meal, we had said the customary blessings over the bread and the wine and swallowed the food in silence. We sensed that we were gathered around the familial table for the last time. I spent that night going over memories and ideas and was unable to fall asleep. At dawn, we were in the street, ready to leave. This time there were no Hungarian police. It had been agreed that the Jewish council would handle everything by itself. 
Our convoy headed toward the main synagogue. The town seemed deserted, but behind the shutters, our friends of yesterday were probably waiting for the moment when they could loot our homes. The synagogue resembled a large railroad station, baggage and tears. The altar was shattered, the wall coverings shredded, the walls themselves bare. There were so many of us we could hardly breathe. The 24 hours we spent there were horrendous. The men were downstairs, the women upstairs. It was Saturday, the Sabbath. And it was as though we were there to attend services. Forbidden to go outside, people relieved themselves in a corner. The next morning we walked toward the station where a convoy of cattle cars was waiting. The Hungarian police made us climb into the cars, 80 persons in each one. They handed us some bread, a few pails of water. They checked the bars on the windows to make sure they would not come loose. The cars were sealed. One person was placed in charge of every car. If someone managed to escape, that person would be shot. Two Gestapo officers strolled down the length of the platform. They were all smiles. All things considered, it had gone very smoothly. A prolonged whistle pierced the air. The wheels began to grind. We were on our way. Lying down was not an option. Nor could we all sit down. We decided to take turns sitting. There was little air. The lucky ones found themselves near a window. They could watch the blooming countryside flit by. After two days of travel, thirst became intolerable, as did the heat. Freed of normal constraints, some of the young let go of their inhibitions and, under cover of darkness, caressed one another without any thought of others, alone in the world. The others pretended not to us. There was still some food left, but we never ate enough to satisfy our hunger. Our principle was to economize, to save for tomorrow. Tomorrow could be worse yet. The train stopped in Kashau, a small town on the Czechoslovakian border. We realized then that we were not staying in Hungary. Our eyes opened to eat. The door of the car slid aside. A German officer stepped in, accompanied by a Hungarian lieutenant acting as his interpreter. From this moment on, you are under the authority of the German army. Anyone who still owns gold, silver, or watches must hand them over now. Anyone who will be found to have kept any of these will be shot on the spot. Secondly, anyone who is ill should report to the hospital car. That's all. The Hungarian lieutenant went around with a basket and retrieved the last possessions from those who chose not to go on tasting the bitterness of fear. There are 80 of you in the car. The German officer added. If anyone goes missing, you will all be shot like dogs. The two disappeared. The doors clanked shut. We had fallen into the trap, up to our necks. The doors were nailed, the way back irrevocably cut off. The world had become a hermetically sealed cattle car. There was a woman among us, a certain, a certain Mrs. Schecht. She was in her fifties, and her ten-year-old son was with her, crouched in a corner. Her husband and two older sons had been deported with the first transport by mistake. The separation had totally shattered her. I knew her well. A quiet, tense woman with piercing eyes. She had been a frequent guest in our house. Her husband was a pious man who spent most of his days and nights in the house of study. It was she who supported the family. Mrs. Schechter had lost her mind. On the first day of the journey, she had already begun to moan. She kept asking why she had been separated from her family. Later, her sobs and screams became hysterical. On the third night, as we were sleeping, some of us sitting huddled against each other, some of us standing. A piercing cry broke the silence. Fire! I see a fire! I see a fire! There was a moment of panic. Who had screamed? It was Mrs. Shade. Standing in the middle of the car, in the faint light filtering through the windows, she looked like a withered tree in a field of wheat. She was howling, pointing through the window. Lou! 
Look, look at this fire. This terrible fire. Have mercy on me. Some pressed against the bars to see. There was nothing. Only the darkness of night. It took us a long time to recover from this harsh awakening. We were still trembling, and with every screech of the wheels, we felt the abyss opening beneath us. Unable to still our anguish, we tried to reassure each other. She is mad, poor woman. Someone had placed a damp rag on her forehead, but she nevertheless continued to scream, Fire! I see a fire! Her little boy was crying, clinging to her skirt, trying to hold her hand. It's nothing, mother. There's nothing there. Please sit down. He paid me even more than did his mother's cries. Some of the women tried to calm her. You'll see, you'll find your husband and sons again in a few days. She continued to scream and sob fitfully. Jews, listen to me, she cried. I see a fire. I see flames, huge flames. It was as though she were possessed by some evil spirit. We tried to reason with her, or to calm ourselves, to catch our breath, and to soothe her. She is hallucinating because she is thirsty, poor woman. That's why she speaks of flames devouring her. But it was all in vain. Our terror could no longer be contained. Our nerves had reached a breaking point. Our very skin was aching. It was as though madness had infected all of us. We gave up. A few young men forced her to sit down, then bound and gagged her. Silence fell again. The small boy sat next to his mother, crying. I started to breathe normally again as I listened to the rhythmic pounding of the wheels on the tracks as the train raced through the night. We could begin to doze again, to rest, to dream. And so, an hour or two passed. Another scream jolted us. The woman had broken free of her bond and was shouting louder than before, Look at the fire! Look at the flames! Flames everywhere! Once again, the young men bound and gagged her. When they actually struck her, people shouted their approval. Keep her quiet. Make that mad woman shut up. She's not the only one here. She received several blows to the head. Blows that could have been lethal. Her son was clinging desperately to her, not uttering a word. He was no longer crying. The night seemed endless. By daybreak, Mrs. Schechter had settled down. Crouching in her corner, her blank gaze fixed on some faraway place, she no longer saw us. She remained like that all day, mute, absent, alone in the midst of us. Toward evening, she began to shout again, the fire over there. She was pointing somewhere in the distance, always the same place. No one felt like beating her anymore. The heat, the thirst, the stench, the lack of air were suffocating us. Yet all that was nothing compared to her screams, which tore us apart. A few more days, and all of us would have started to scream. But we were pulling into a station. Someone near a window read to us, Auschwitz. of the wagon slid open. Two men were given permission to fetch water. When they came back, they told us that they had learned in exchange for a gold watch that this was the final destination. We were to leave the train here. There was a labor camp on the site. The conditions were good. Families would not be separated. Only the young would work in the factories. The old and the sick would find work in the fields. Confidence soared. Suddenly, we felt free of the previous night's terror. We gave thanks to God. Mrs. Schechter remained huddled in her corner, mute, untouched by the optimism around her. Her little one was stroking her head. Dusk began to fill the wagon. We ate what was left of our food. At ten o'clock in the evening, we were all trying to find a position for a quick nap, and soon we were dozing. Suddenly, Look at the fire! Look at the flames! Over there! With a start, we awoke and rushed to the window yet again. We had believed her, if only for an instant. But there was nothing outside but darkness. We returned to our places, shame in our 
souls, but fear gnawing at us nevertheless. As she went on howling, she was struck again. Only with great difficulty did we succeed in quieting her down. The man in charge of our wagon called out to a German officer strolling down the platform, asking him to have the sick woman moved to a hospital car. Patience, the German replied. Patience should be taken there soon. Around 11 o'clock, the train began to move again. We pressed against the windows. The convoy was rolling slowly. A quarter of an hour later, it began to slow down even more. Through the windows, we saw barbed wire. We understood that this was the camp. We had forgotten Mrs. Schechter's existence. Suddenly, there was a terrible scream. Jews, look! Look at the fire! Look at the flames! And as the train stopped, this time we saw flames rising from a tall chimney into a black sky. Mrs. Schechter had fallen silent on her own. Mute again, indifferent, absent, she had returned to a corner. We stared at the flames in the darkness. A wretched stench floated in the air. Abruptly, our doors opened. Strange-looking creatures dressed in striped jackets and black pants jumped into the wagon. Holding flashlights and sticks, they began to strike at us left and right, shouting, Everybody out! Leave everything inside! Hurry up! We jumped out. I glanced at Mrs. Schechter. Her little boy was still holding her hand. In front of us, those flames. In the air, the smell of burning flesh. It must have been around midnight. We had arrived in Birkenau. The beloved objects that we had carried with us from place to place were now left behind in the wagon, and with them, finally, our illusions. Every few yards there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. Hand in hand we followed the throng. An SS came toward us wielding a club. He commanded, men to the left, women to the right. Eight words, spoken quietly, indifferently, without emotion. Eight simple, short words. Yet that was the moment when I left my mother. There was no time to think and I already felt my father's hand press against mine. We were alone. In a fraction of a second, I could see my mother, my sisters, move to the right. Tsipora was holding mother's hand. I saw them walking farther and farther away. Mother was stroking my sister's blonde hair as if to protect her. And I walked on with my father, with the men. I didn't know that this was the moment in time and the place where I was leaving my mother and Zipporah forever. I kept walking, my father holding my hand. Behind me, an old man fell to the ground. Nearby, an SS man replaced his revolver in its holster. My hand tightened its grip on my father. All I could think of was not to lose him, not to remain alone. The SS officers gave the order, Form ranks of fives! There was a tumult. It was imperative to stay together. Hey, kid, how old are you? The man interrogating me was an inmate. I couldn't see his face, but his voice was weary and warm. Fifteen? No, you're eighteen. But I'm not, I said. I'm fifteen. Fool, listen to what I say. Then he asked my father, who answered, I'm fifty. No, the man now sounded angry. Not fifty, you're forty. Do you hear? Eighteen and forty. He disappeared into the darkness. Another inmate appeared, unleashing a string of invectives. Sons of bitches, why have you come here? Tell me, why? Someone dared to reply, What do you think? That we came here of our own free will? That we asked to come here? The others seemed ready to kill him. Shut up, you moron, or I'll tear you to pieces. You should have hanged yourselves rather than come here. Didn't you know what was in store for you here in Auschwitz? You didn't know? In 1944? True. We didn't know. Nobody had told us. He couldn't believe his ears. His tone became even harsher. Over there. Do you see the chimney over there? Do you see it? And the flames, do you see them? Yes, we saw the flames. 
Over there, that's where they will take you. Over there will be your grave. You still don't understand, you sons of bitches. Don't you understand anything? You will be burned, burned to a cinder, turned into ashes. His anger changed into fury. We stood stunned, petrified. Could this be just a nightmare? An unimaginable nightmare. I heard whispers around me. We must do something. We can't let them kill us like that, like cattle in the slaughterhouse. We must revolt. There were among us a few tough young men. They actually had knives and were urging us to attack the armed guards. One of them was muttering, let the world learn about the existence of Auschwitz. Let everybody find out about it while they still have a chance to escape. But the older men begged their sons not to be foolish. We mustn't give up hope. Even now, as the sword hangs over our heads, so taught our sages. The wind of revolt died down. We continued to walk until we came to a crossroads. Standing in the middle of it was, though I didn't know it then, Dr. Mengele, the notorious Dr. Mengele. He looked like the typical SS officer, a cruel, though not unintelligent, face complete with monocle. He was holding a conductor's baton and was surrounded by officers. The baton was moving constantly, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. In no time, I stood before him. Your age? he asked, perhaps trying to sound paternal. I'm 18. My voice was trembling. In good health? Yes. Your profession? Tell him that I was a student. Farmer, I heard myself saying. This conversation lasted no more than a few seconds. It seemed like an eternity. The baton pointed to the left. I took half a step forward. I first wanted to see where they would send my father. Were he to have gone to the right, I would have run after him. The baton once more moved to the left, a weight lifted from my heart. We did not know as yet which was the better side, right or left, which road led to prison and which to the crematorium. Still, I was happy I was near my father. Our procession continued slowly to move forward. Another inmate came over to us. Satisfied? Yes, someone answered. Poor devils, you are heading for the crematorium. He seemed to be telling the truth. Not far from us, flames, huge flames, were rising from a ditch. Something was being burned there. A truck drew close and unloaded its hold. Small children. Babies. Yes. I did see this with my own eyes. Children thrown into the flames. Is it any wonder that ever since then, sleep tends to elude me? So that was where we were going. A little farther on, there was another, larger pit for adults. I pinched myself. Was I still alive? Was I awake? How was it possible that men, women, and children were being burned and that the world kept silent? No. All this could not be real. A nightmare, perhaps. Soon, I would wake up with a start, my heart pounding and find that I was back in the room of my childhood with my books. My father's voice tore me from my daydreams. What a shame. A shame that you did not go with your mother. I saw many children your age go with their mothers. His voice was terribly sad. I understood that he did not wish to see what they would do to me. He did not wish to see his only son go up in flames. My forehead was covered with cold sweat. Still, I told him that I could not believe that human beings were being burned in our times. The world would never tolerate such crimes. The world? The world is not interested in us. Today, everything is possible. Even the crematoria. His voice broke. Father, I said, if that is true, then I don't want to wait. I'll run into the electrified barbed wire. That would be easier than a slow death in the flames. He didn't answer. He was weeping. 
His body was shaking. Everybody around us was weeping. Someone began to recite Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. I don't know whether during the history of the Jewish people men have ever before recited the Kaddish for themselves. Yiskadal, the Yiskadash, Shimei Rabo. May his name be celebrated and sanctified, whispered my father. For the first time, I felt anger rising within me. Why should I sanctify his name? The Almighty, the eternal and terrible master of the universe, chose to be silent. What was there to thank him for? We continued our march. We were coming closer and closer to the pit from which an infernal heat was rising. Twenty more steps. If I was going to kill myself, this was the time. Our column had only some fifteen steps to go. I bit my lips so that my father would not hear my teeth chattering. Ten more steps. Eight. Seven. We were walking slowly as one follows a hearse. Our own funeral procession. Only four more steps. Three. There it was, now, very close to us, the pit and its flames. I gathered all that remained of my strength in order to break rank and throw myself onto the barbed wire. Deep down, I was saying goodbye to my father, to the whole universe, and against my will, I found myself whispering the words, Yiskadal Yiskadash Rabo, may his name be exalted and sanctified. My heart was about to burst. There, I was face to face with the angel of death. No. Two steps from the pit, we were ordered to turn left and herded into barracks. I squeezed my father's hand. He said, Do you remember Mrs. Schechter in the train? Never shall I forget that night. The first night in camp that turned my life into one long night seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget those things, even were I condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. The barrack we had been assigned to was very long. On the roof, a few bluish skylights. I thought, this is what the antechamber of hell must look like. So many crazed men, so much shouting, so much brutality. Dozens of inmates were there to receive us, sticks in hand, striking anywhere, anyone without reason. The orders came, strip, hurry up, Klaus, hold on only to your belt and your shoes. Our clothes were to be thrown on the floor at the back of the barrack. There was a pile there already, new suits, old ones, torn overcoats, rags. For us it meant true equality, nakedness. We trembled in the cold. A few SS officers wandered through the room looking for strong men. If vigor was that appreciated, perhaps one should try to appear sturdy. My father thought the opposite, better not to draw attention. We later found out that he had been right. Those who were selected that day were incorporated into the Zonderkommando, the commando working in the crematoria. Bela Katz, the son of an important merchant of my town, had arrived in Birkenau with the first transport one week ahead of us. When he found out that we were there, he succeeded in slipping us a note. He told us that having been chosen because of his strength, he had been forced to place his own father's body into the furnace. The blows continued to rain on us. To the barber! Belt and shoes in hand, I let myself be dragged along to the barbers. Their clippers tore out our hair, shaved every hair on our bodies. My head was buzzing. 
the same thought surfacing over and over, not to be separated from my father. Freed from the barber's clutches, we began to wander about the crowd, finding friends, acquaintances. Every encounter filled us with joy. Yes, joy. Thank God you are still alive. Some were crying. They used whatever strength they had left to cry. Why had they let themselves be brought here? Why didn't they die in their beds? Their words were interspersed with sobs. Suddenly, someone threw his arms around me in a hug. Yechiel, the Zigater Rebbe's brother. He was weeping bitterly. I thought he was crying with joy at still being alive. Don't cry, Yechiel, I said. Don't waste your tears. Not cry. We're on the threshold of death. Soon we shall be inside. Do you understand? Inside? How could I not cry? I watched darkness fade through the bluish skylights in the roof. I no longer was afraid. I was overcome by fatigue. The absent no longer entered our thoughts. One spoke of them, who knows what happened to them, but their fate was not on our minds. We were incapable of thinking. Our senses were numbed. Everything was fading into a fog. We no longer clung to anything. The instincts of self-preservation, of self-defense, of pride, had all deserted us. In one terrifying moment of lucidity, I thought of us as damned souls wandering through the void, souls condemned to wander through space until the end of time, seeking redemption, seeking oblivion, without any hope of finding either. Around five o'clock in the morning, we were expelled from the barrack. The capos were beating us again, but I no longer felt the pain. A glacial wind was enveloping us. We were naked, holding our shoes and belts. An order, run! And we ran. After a few minutes of running, a new barrack. A barrel of foul-smelling liquid stood by the door. Disinfection. Everybody soaked in it. Then came a hot shower, all very fast. As we left the showers, we were chased outside and ordered to run some more. Another barrack, the storeroom. Very long tables, mountains of prison guard. As we ran, they threw the clothes at us. Pants, jackets, shirts. In a few seconds, we had ceased to be men. Had the situation not been so tragic, we might have laughed. We looked pretty strange. Mayor Katz, a colossus, wore a child's pants and Stern, a skinny little fellow, was floundering in a huge jacket. We immediately started to switch. I glanced over at my father. How changed he looked. His eyes were veiled. I wanted to tell him something, but I didn't know what. The night had passed completely. The morning star shone in the sky. I too had become a different person. The student of Talmud, the child I was, had been consumed by the flames. All that was left was a shape that resembled me. My soul had been invaded and devoured by a black flame. So many events had taken place in just a few hours that I had completely lost all notion of time. When had we left our homes and the ghetto and the train only a week ago? One night? One single night? How long had we been standing in the freezing wind? One hour? A single hour? Sixty minutes? Surely it was a dream. Not far from us, prisoners were at work. Some were digging holes, others were carrying sand. None as much as glanced at us. We were withered trees in the heart of the desert. Behind me, people were talking. I had no desire to listen to what they were saying or to know who was speaking and what about. Nobody dared raise his voice. Even though there was no guard around, we whispered, perhaps because of the thick smoke that poisoned the air and stung the throat. We were herded into yet another barrack inside the gypsy camp. We fell into ranks of five. And now stop moving. There was no floor, a roof and four walls. Our feet sank into the mud. Again the waiting. I fell asleep standing up. I dreamed of a bed, of my mother's hand on my face. 
I woke. I was standing, my feet in the mud. Some people collapsed, sliding into the mud. Others shouting, are you crazy? We were told to stand. Do you want to get us all in trouble? As if all the troubles in the world were not already upon us. Little by little, we all sat down in the mud. But we had to get up whenever a capo came in to check if, by chance, somebody had a new pair of shoes. If so, we had to hand them over. No use protesting. The blows multiplied and, in the end, one still had to hand them over. I had new shoes myself, but as they were covered with a thick coat of mud, they had not been noticed. I thanked God in an improvised prayer for having created mud in his infinite and wondrous universe. Suddenly the silence became more oppressive. An SS officer had come in and, with him, the smell of the angel of death. We stared at his fleshy lips. He harangued us from the center of the barrack. You are in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. A pause. He was observing the effect his words had produced. His face remains in my memory to this day. The tall man in his thirties. Crime written all over his forehead and his gaze. He looked at us as one would a pack of leprous dogs clinging to life. Remember, he went on, remember it always. Let it be graven in your memories. You are in Auschwitz, and Auschwitz is not a convalescent home. It is a concentration camp. Here you must work. If you don't, you will go straight to the chimney, to the crematorium. Work or crematorium, the choice is yours. We had already lived through a lot that night. We thought that nothing could frighten us anymore. But his harsh words sent shivers through us. The word chimney here was not an abstraction. It floated in the air, mingled with the smoke. It was perhaps the only word that had a real meaning in this place. He left the barrack. The capos arrived, shouting, All specialists, locksmiths, carpenters, electricians, watchmakers, one step forward. The rest of us were transferred to yet another barrack, this one of stone. We had permission to sit down. A gypsy inmate was in charge. My father suddenly had a colic attack. He got up and asked politely in German, Excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? The gypsy stared at him for a long time from head to toe, as if he wished to ascertain that the person addressing him was actually a creature of flesh and bone, a human being with a body and a belly. Then, as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. I stood, petrified. What had happened to me? My father had just been struck in front of me, and I had not even blinked. I had watched and kept silent. Only yesterday I would have dug my nails into this criminal's flesh. Had I changed that much so fast? Remorse began to gnaw at me. All I could think was, I shall never forgive them for this. My father must have guessed my thoughts because he whispered in my ear, It doesn't hurt. His cheek still bore the red mark of the hand. Everybody outside! A dozen or so gypsies had come to join our guard. The clubs and whips were cracking around me. My feet were running on their own. I tried to protect myself from the blows by hiding behind others. It was spring. The sun was shining. Fall in, five by five. The prisoners I had glimpsed that morning were working nearby. No guard in sight. Only the chimney's shadow. Lulled by the sunshine and my dreams, I felt someone pulling at my sleeve. It was my father. Come on, son. We marched. Gates opened and closed. We continued to march between the barbed wire. At every step, white signs with black skulls looked down on us. The inscription, warning, danger of death. What irony. Was there here a single place where one was not in danger of death? The gypsies had stopped next to a barrack. They were replaced by SS men who encircled us with machine guns and police dogs. 
the march had lasted half an hour. Looking around me, I noticed that the barbed wire was behind us. We had left the camp. It was a beautiful day in May. The fragrances of spring were in the air. The sun was setting. But no sooner had we taken a few more steps than we saw the barbed wire of another camp. This one had an iron gate with the overhead inscription Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. Auschwitz. First impression, better than Birkenau. Cement buildings with two stories rather than wooden barracks. Little gardens here and there. We were led toward one of those blocks. Seated on the ground by the entrance, we began to wait again. From time to time, somebody was allowed to go in. These were the showers, a compulsory routine. Going from one camp to the other several times a day, we had each time to go through them. After the hot shower, we stood shivering in the darkness. Our clothes had been left behind. We had been promised other clothes. Around midnight, we were told to run. Faster, yelled our guards. The faster you run, the faster you'll get to go to sleep. After a few minutes of racing madly, we came to a new block. The man in charge was waiting. He was a young Pole who was smiling at us. He began to talk to us, and despite our weariness, we listened attentively. Comrades, you are now in the concentration camp Auschwitz. Ahead of you lies a long road paved with suffering. Don't lose hope. You have already eluded the worst danger, the selection. Therefore, muster your strength and keep your faith. We shall all see the day of liberation. Have faith in life, a thousand times faith. By driving out despair, you will move away from death. Hell does not last forever. And now, here is a prayer, or rather, a piece of advice. Let there be camaraderie among you. We are all brothers and share the same fate. The same smoke hovers over all our heads. Help each other. That is the only way to survive. And now, enough said, you are tired. Listen, you are in block 17. I am responsible for keeping order here. Anyone with a complaint may come to see me. That is all. Go to sleep. Two people to a bunk. Good night. Those were the first human words. No sooner had we climbed into our bunks than we fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, the veteran inmates treated us without brutality. We went to wash. We were given new clothing. They brought us black coffee. We left the block around 10 o'clock so it could be cleaned. Outside, the sun warmed us. Our morale was much improved. A good night's sleep had done its work. Friends met, exchanged a few sentences. We spoke of everything without ever mentioning those who had disappeared. The prevailing opinion was that the war was about to end. At about noon, we were brought some soup, one bowl of thick soup for each of us. I was terribly hungry, yet I refused to touch it. I was still the spoiled child of long ago. My father swallowed my ration. We then had a short nap in the shade of the block. That SS officer in the muddy barrack must have been lying. Auschwitz was, after all, a convalescent home. In the afternoon, they made us line up. Three prisoners brought a table and some medical instruments. We were told to roll up our left sleeves and file past the table. The three veteran prisoners, needles in hand, tattooed numbers on our left arms. I became A-7713. From then on, I had no other name. At dusk, a roll call. The work commandos had returned. The orchestra played military marches near the camp entrance. Tens of thousands of inmates stood in rows while the SS checked their numbers. After the roll call, the prisoners from all the blocks dispersed looking for friends, relatives or neighbors among the arrivals of the latest convoy. Days went by. In the mornings, black coffee. At midday, soup. By the third day, I was eagerly eating any kind of soup. At six o'clock in the afternoon, roll call, followed by bread with something. At nine o'clock, bedtime. 
They had already been in Auschwitz for eight days. It was after roll call we stood waiting for the bell announcing its end. Suddenly, I noticed someone passing between the rows. I heard him ask, Who among you is Wiesel von Sigurd? The person looking for us was a small fellow with spectacles and a wizened face. My father answered, That's me, Wiesel von Sigurd. The fellow's eyes narrowed. He took a long look at my father. You don't know me. You don't recognize me. I'm your relative, Stein. Already forgotten? Stein. Stein from Antwerp. Rezo's husband. Your wife was Rezo's aunt. She often wrote to us and such letters. My father had not recognized him. He must have barely known him, always being up to his neck in communal affairs and not knowledgeable in family matters. He was always elsewhere, lost in thought. Once, a cousin came to see us in Sigurd. She had stayed at our house and eaten at our table for two weeks before my father noticed her presence for the first time. No, he did not remember Stein. I recognized him right away. I had known Rezel, his wife, before she had left for Belgium. He told us that he had been deported in 1942. He said, I heard people say that a transport had arrived from your region and I came to look for you. I thought you might have some news of Rezel and my two small boys who stayed in Antwerp. I knew nothing about them. Since 1940, my mother had not received a single letter from them. But I lied. Yes, my mother did hear from them. Rezel is fine, so are the children. He was weeping with joy. He would have liked to stay longer to learn more details, to soak up the good news, but an SS was heading in our direction, and he had to go, telling us that he would come back the next day. The bell announced that we were dismissed. We went to fetch the evening meal, bread and margarine. I was terribly hungry and swallowed my ration on the spot. My father told me, You mustn't eat all at once. Tomorrow is another day. But seeing that his advice had come too late, and that there was nothing left of my ration, he didn't even start his own. Me? I'm not hungry, he said. We remained in Auschwitz for three weeks. We had nothing to do. We slept a lot, in the afternoon and at night. Our one goal was to avoid the transports, to stay here as long as possible. It wasn't difficult. It was enough never to sign up as a skilled worker. The unskilled were kept until the end. At the start of the third week, our Block Elteste was removed. He was judged too humane. The new one was ferocious and his aides were veritable monsters. The good days were over. We began to wonder whether it wouldn't be better to let ourselves be chosen for the next transport. Stein, our relative from Antwerp, continued to visit us and from time to time he would bring a half portion of bread. Here, this is for you, Eliezer. Every time he came, tears would roll down his icy cheeks. He would often say to my father, Take care of your son. He is very weak, very dehydrated. Take care of yourselves. You must avoid selection. Eat anything, anytime. Eat all you can. The weak don't last very long around here. And he himself was so thin, so withered, so weak. The only thing that keeps me alive, he kept saying, is to know that Rezel and the little ones are still alive. Were it not for them, I would give up. One evening he came to see us, his face radiant. The transport just arrived from Antwerp. I shall go to see them tomorrow. Surely they will have news. He left. We never saw him again. He had been given the news. The real news. Evenings, as we lay on our cots, we sometimes tried to sing a few Hasidic melodies. Akiba Drummer would break our hearts with his deep, grave voice. Some of the men spoke of God, his mysterious ways, the sins of the Jewish people, and the redemption to come. As for me, I had ceased to pray. I concurred with Job. I was not denying his existence, but I doubted his absolute justice. 
Akiba Drummer said, God is testing us. He wants to see whether we are capable of overcoming our base instincts, of killing the Satan within ourselves. We have no right to despair. And if he punishes us mercilessly, it is a sign that he loves us that much more. Hershkinut, well versed in Kabbalah, spoke of the end of the world and the coming of the Messiah. From time to time, in the middle of all that talk, a thought crossed my mind. Where is mother right now? And Zipporah, mother is still a young woman, my father once said. She must be in a labor camp. And Zipporah, she's a big girl now. She too must be in a camp. How we would have liked to believe that. We pretended. For what if one of us still did believe? All the skilled workers had already been sent to other camps. Only about a hundred of us simple laborers were left. Today it's your turn, announced the block secretary. You are leaving with the next transport. At ten o'clock we were handed our daily ration of bread. A dozen or so SS surrounded us. At the gate the sign proclaimed that work meant freedom. We were counted, and there we were in the countryside on a sunny road. In the sky, a few small white clouds. We were walking slowly. The guards were in no hurry. We were glad of it. As we were passing through some of the villages, many Germans watched us, showing no surprise. No doubt they had seen quite a few of these processions. On the way, we saw some young German girls. The guards began to tease them. The girls giggled. They allowed themselves to be kissed and tickled, bursting with laughter. They all were laughing, joking, and passing love notes to one another. At least during all that time, we endured neither shouting nor blows. After four hours, we arrived at the new camp, Buna. The iron gate closed behind us. <laughs> 